Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of McGill Cares, a webcast series supporting family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver, certified dementia care consultant, and founder of McGill University's Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team of leading healthcare professionals to oversee the program, who include Dr. Jose Moret from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, and Dr. Gerald Fried, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of donors. And I would like to thank Ryan and Dominic Lynam for sponsoring today's webcast in memory of their wonderful nanas, Stella Pearson and Muriel Wilson. Today, we are celebrating the one year anniversary of the launch of McGill Cares. And I wanted to acknowledge it by sharing some of the most important lessons that I learned on my personal journey as a caregiver to my mother, which had a ripple effect on my own health. I could not be happier than to be joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Jose Moret, as we share the prescription of care following a diagnosis of dementia. Dr. Moret is Professor and Director of Geriatric Medicine at the McGill Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, the McGill University Health Center, and the Jewish General Hospital. In addition to being academic lead of the McGill Dementia Education Program, he is co-director of the Quebec Network for Research on Aging and past president of the Canadian Geriatrics Society. This information is intended to educate family and informal caregivers so that they can provide the best care possible to the person who is being diagnosed with dementia and ensure their own health and well being. Dr. Marais, welcome to McGill Cares once again. Hi, Claire. Hi, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Already one year has passed by and we'll continue our interactions for the benefit of uh, people living with dementia. For those, of, for those of you who are not aware, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were welcoming uh, family caregivers at the university uh, in this classroom. And we were offering one day workshops with a multidisciplinary team of healthcare professionals and really you know, providing education to them. And you know, when the pandemic hit, I said, we have to find a way of really connecting and staying in touch with, with family caregivers. Dr. Moret, it's been a year that the pandemic has taken place. And what do you find are some of the biggest challenges that caregivers are now facing? Due to the COVID pandemic, uh, there is a lot of isolation happening, both to the caregiver as well as, as the person suffering from dementia. And consequences are now uh, appearing. We see in our clinics uh, a, a faster deterioration of the cognition, the aspects of memory and decision-making judgment, as well as physical, because uh, there has been more reported uh, uh, deconditioning leading to falls and mobility issues that was not there before. So uh, COVID has taken a toll out of uh, people with dementia more than the general population in general. And what's been the biggest impact on the, the family members or the informal caregivers? Obviously, they feel themselves alone to deal with the demands of a, a loved one who is uh, suffering from, from dementia and the consequence, the number of burnouts, uh, anxiety, and even depression is appearing, you know, because to face the demands of such a disease, you shouldn't be doing it alone is a continuous uh, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and you can get tired, we are humans. And as a consequence, uh, they should be connected with the community, uh, their family members outside of the household, but also the professionals uh, that are part of the home care services in their uh, communities. So Dr. Moret, I'm very, very pleased uh, that you are joining me today uh, on the topic of a, prescri a prescription of care following a diagnosis of dementia. You know, prior to the pandemic, the majority of people who were receiving a diagnosis of dementia weren't properly educated, um, which results obviously in, in, you know, a lack of education, a lack of quality of care. So I find more than ever, uh, people really need to be educated and understand what's going on. Um, I'm also happy that you're joining me because you know a lot of what I'm sharing is 
based on my own personal experience. And so to have, you know, a medical professional such as yourself to validate, you know, the information that we're sharing is, is very important to me. So, yep. so to begin, uh, you know, this webcast is dedicated to the memory of my mother, um, whom I had the honor to accompany on her journey with Alzheimer's disease. Her name was Yeno Aniki Leskinen, and she was born in a small town called Impalati in Finland. And so it's always around this time of the year in May that I like to honor uh, the journey that we had together. So the whole premise of what we are going to be talking about today is really the fact that a lack of education about dementia will have a significant impact on the quality of care, as well as the safety of the individual who is being diagnosed, as well as on their caregivers. Now, I'd like to just preempt this by saying the definition of caregiver is somebody that is not paid in the sense of the family caregiver. So it could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be a colleague. But, you know, oftentimes people think, well, I'm not a caregiver, you know, I'm a caregiver is someone who's paid. Even if you're not paid, you, you are identified as a caregiver. And it took me many years to come to that realization. So the, I'm also extremely grateful uh, to McGill University and to Dr. Moret and Dr. Gauthier. We um, you know, are the leaders of the McGill Dementia Education Program. And you know, I must let everybody know that you know, prior to you know, founding this program, I did not have any relationship with the university. I didn't attend the university. My husband, my children did not attend the university. I was really just an ordinary citizen who had an idea and I approached one of the best medical schools in the world. So, you know, I just wanted to let everybody know that when you do have an idea and you believe in something that you're passionate about, anything can happen. So our, the most important objectives of our program, number one, is to educate individuals. Education is key for everything. So with the journey of, di of dementia, it's important to become as educated as possible. The next thing that's important is that you anticipate, anticipate what's coming next. You need to be one step ahead at all times of the illness. Okay? The other important point is navigation. How do you navigate care? How do you navigate the healthcare system, regardless of where you live? How do you navigate the, the community resources that are available to you, the public healthcare resources? So you need to be educated and know how to navigate that. Also, a big role that I played and that many people will play is that of an advocate. So as the disease progresses and the person that you're caring for can no longer represent themselves, they don't have the voice to be able to communicate, the role of the caregiver is to assume that voice for their behalf, to ensure their care, to ensure their well-being, to assure their safety. So that has been the primary objectives of our program to teach individuals how to do this. And soon we are in the process of developing another program where we are going to be facilitating connections among caregivers. During this time of isolation, it's very hard for people to connect. So stay tuned for something that new that's coming in the fall where we're gonna really be facilitating connections among caregivers. For those of you who may have missed the, the McGill Cares webcast of March 24th, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to Dr. Serge Gauthier as he discusses a journey through the diagnosis of dementia, the process, the steps that the clinicians take in order to make the diagnosis. So this is kind of like a complement to that first webcast. So I really encourage you all to go to McGill Cares and watch that webcast. Um, also, McGill University, we have the honor, Dr. José Marais, Dr. Serge Gauthier, Dr. Pedro Rosanetto, and myself, to be the lead editors on the World Alzheimer Report for 2021 and 2022. Uh, we were commissioned by Alzheimer's Disease International. So this is a very big honor for the university. And as a person with lived experience, I'm very honored to have been part of this team. So to begin my, my, my uh, presentation, I'm gonna share a little bit of background. Um, I call myself a caregiver crusader. I have really been on a crusade to change the healthcare system from the moment that my mother was diagnosed in 2006. I'm a certified dementia care consultant and uh, you can learn more about me at carecrosswalk.com. Um, so, you know, in brief, uh, I, was a, I was a caregiver to my mom. These are some images 
Uh, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in September of 2006. In her early 70s, my mother was a very healthy woman, um, very dynamic. She was a tennis player. Um, you know, I was really part of um, the sandwich generation of caregivers. This shows, you know, from, from the previous slide, what this disease does and, and the evolution. So it's not only, uh, it doesn't only impact somebody's memory and behavior, but it really takes a physical toll on the person. So, um, you know, when things, when I started suspecting that things weren't right with my mom, I went to see, um, you know, a family physician who then referred me to a neurologist. And after performing only one test, which was the mini mental mocha test, the prescription of care that I received from the doctor was, good luck, Mrs. Webster. And those three words were what has what really set me off on my course to do the work that I'm doing. Because I wasn't provided any information, or I should say we were not provided any information. That's all I got was good luck, Mrs. Webster. And one of the reasons I approached McGill University to, you know, to start working with them was because I said, this cannot keep happening to people, which I know it unfortunately does. Um, you know, that this was a diagnosis I received in 2006, and many families that I'm working with today are still receiving this type of um, lack of information, as I'd say. So what happens is there's the whole now what? So imagine if you're receiving a diagnosis of heart disease or cancer or diabetes, you would never leave a doctor's office without some type of prescription, some type of information. Right? So I've been advocating for years about the importance of educating and informing families. So I'm going to have Dr. Moret jump in with me now. But really, you know, uh, you know, and since 2006, I've met maybe over a thousand people. And I, I've put together a list of questions that are the most frequently asked that go unanswered. So would I be correct, Dr. Moret, in saying that these are the most frequently asked questions? Yes, this is the type of questions one faces in our offices after we have uh, uh, made the diagnosis. People have questions and they, they, they should receive legitimate answers as well. Uh, not that we know everything about the disease and the outcomes and what's going to happen in the future, but we have some ideas because the history of the disease, which is a, a, a continuous deterioration over time of the the cognitive uh, uh, capacities, memory, judgment, decision making, etc. We know that there is the disease goes through different stages, so there is things one can can learn, um, can uh, anticipate, prepare ourselves for the different stages of the disease progression. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So these, a lot of these questions, if you go back to Dr. Gauthier's um, webcast, you will be answered and many of Miguel cares. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking today about once you receive a diagnosis, how to prepare yourself. But, you know, prior to uh, my mother receiving a diagnosis, I had no idea whatsoever what dementia was. So I'll imagine now that majority of people who are in the process of getting a diagnosis and now you have COVID. So COVID happens, many people cannot see a person, uh, sorry, a healthcare professional in person. So COVID has even added even much more of an impact to these questions that are going unanswered. So back to my story, and, and, I, and I wanna talk, say one thing about my story is I, I don't feel that my journey was any more difficult than anybody else's. I'm just someone who's chosen to share what happened to me. Um, and it was a big part of my healing process. You know, I was your typical caregiver, as I will show, where I wanted to pretend that everything was fine and I didn't need help. But the only way that I was able to really finally get the support that I need was to really show my vulnerability. So I represented at the time, I had no brothers or sisters. My father had passed away in 2005. So that was a year before my mother's diagnosis. I come from a home of where my mother was a caregiver to my, my father my entire life. So caregiving has kind of been in my, you know, part of my roots uh, along the way. 
But, you know, like many people, you know, when you're caring for somebody, you still have a whole other life going on. So when I started my journey, I was only in my late 30s. I had three young children. I was working full time. You know, we had a lot of things going on in our life and I was pulled in so many directions. And for those of you who have never heard the term before of sandwich generation, what that means, it's a person who is caring for young children while also caring for aging parents. So I was really pulled in a multitude of directions. And, you know, life happens, you know, we expect the unexpected. I mean, we think we have things in control, but then life will constantly throw us challenges along the way. And I had many of them. I think it would take a two hour webcast to, to explain all the challenges. But, you know, at some point during a, a two year period, you know, my son had, for example, this was in 2009, my son went away to summer camp. And he had a, 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 unfortunately had a very severe accident at the summer camp where he had a broken femur, was had to be hospitalized for three weeks. Um, he was in a wheelchair, had to have a second surgery. You know, he's had, uh, you know, he was a soccer player. He had all these different, you know, accidents and injuries happen. And meanwhile, my mother, you know, from the time she was diagnosed in 2006 until, until the end, all kinds of things were happening to her. You know, she had been hospitalized for hip replacement surgery that was going, that had unfortunately gone wrong. She had suffered a heart attack post-surgery. So I was really caught at one point between caring for my, my, my child who had, had, was going through some health crisis and the mother. And I was being pulled. It was, I remember the time where I was, you know, going from hospital to hospital, from St. Hospital to St. Mary's Hospital. And, you know, I was, I was really pulled and, and, you know, during this time, first of all, I must say that nobody in the healthcare system ever asked me how I was doing, you know, um, and the, the friends that were asking me if I needed help, you know, I was always saying to them, I'm fine, you know, everything's good, you know, I was trying to put this persona all the time, right, but I wasn't fine inside, I was truly unraveling. And, you know, I, I like to show this 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 picture of superwoman being crisis because I really did believe that I was superwoman. I really did believe that I could manage my family and all the challenges that were there, that I could manage the care of my mother. And I need to remind you all that I was managing the care of my mother without having any type of proper information. I did not know this disease. I did not know what to expect. So I was really just, as they say, winging it, okay? And so this is what happens when you try to just wing it, okay? So the, these are very, very common, um, you know, coping mechanisms and emotions that families go through. So in my case, you know, I mean, I was going through this period of, and, and I'll ask Dr. Marie to jump in here with me because you, you work with so many families, but, you know, oftentimes we're kind of like in denial. We cannot believe this is happening to us. And then the guilt. And then, you know, the concept that I only learned in learned later on was that from the moment you receive this type of diagnosis, you're constantly grieving, you know, you're constantly grieving what that person can cannot do. You're constantly grieving the lack of communication with them, you know, and what I was doing, which is, you know, and I wanted people to know that you're not alone in order to manage all of these feelings, my coping mechanism was one, you know, other people may be turning to other you know, ways of coping, but my, my coping mechanism was wine. So I'll ask Dr. Moha if you could jump in with me. Yes, certainly. I mean, your history is, is typical. There's many other persons uh, uh, on the same uh, uh, situation that you went through. And, uh, you know, at the beginning is very subtle, the changes that the, the loved one is presenting. And because you care, because you love, you try to compensate but the disease progress and the amount of involvement increases. And then you find yourself into a, a situation in which all of your resources, all of your positive thinking is challenged. And now you, 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 you have to think about yourself and isolating yourself is the worst thing you can do. You have mm -hmm. to seek help, understand what the disease is, find resources so that you can continue helping your loved one and find yourself also in a healthy situation rather than having recourse to uh, uh, types of compensations will, will not uh, help you at all, you know? 
So from the moment my mom was diagnosed in 2006, I went for a period of five years without any type of support at all. And again, as I mentioned, you know, for those, you know, friends that were trying to reach out to offer to pick up my kids from school or just offer to help, I kept saying, I'm all good. Many thanks. I'm all good. Um, but I wasn't good. And so I was really, really starting to unravel. And, and you know, one of the one of my motivating factors of doing what I'm doing is I didn't realize at the time, but my children are watching. So when I was picking them up from school and going home and opening up those bottles of wine, you know, and drinking too much and not being able to be present for them and not being able to help them with the homework, you know, I, I didn't realize until many years later that the impact that it had on them. I also must say that, you know, as women, we think that we're indestructible. And, you know, I'm a person that has suffered from cardiac illnesses my entire life, and it had a significant impact on my health and well-being. And, you know, even though my mom passed away in 2016, these coping mechanisms that I had used for so many years stayed with me. Today, I've been sober. I'm, it's been over a year. I haven't had a drop of wine. But, it, but a lot of people think, oh, once the caregiving years are over, I'll be fine. But these habits, these habits don't just go away. So I just want everybody to know you're not alone. And it's important to try to seek support for yourself as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah. And not wait till you suffer some, some serious health setbacks. All right. So now we are going to talk about well, Claire's prescription of care, assisted by Dr. Moret, of the most important lessons um, that I learned and that we want to share with everyone. So our primary objective as caregivers is that we want to ensure that our loved one be happy, be safe, and be clean, because that is what matters the most. And that's what we're all you know, fighting for and advocating for. That's what we want. We want to preserve the dignity of, of this incredible human being that we care for so much. So now I would like to take everyone through this, the most important steps and lessons learned, you know, upon um, a diagnosis. But even before that, when you get that first appointment with the healthcare professional, how to be prepared, and I want to include telemedicine um, for those people because of COVID that may be having appointments via Zoom with their doctor, you know, you need to prepare the following. So Dr. Mohe, why don't you explain the following? Uh, certainly, because uh, if it is indeed the first appointment, um, the doctor needs to know about the person and as well as uh, what, what is the symptoms and the concerns uh, of the disease and, and the concerns of the caregiver. So you need to be prepared with uh, past medical history and uh, what the medications a uh, person is taking and what is the manifestations. It, it might uh, help you by asking specific questions that help him to have an understanding of the diagnosis. This is, does the person does have dementia or not? Uh, but, but it reached a point as well in which you should be asking questions to see what uh, he has arrived at in his evaluation you know and once once the the diagnosis is being mentioned you know you are allowed to understand what are the demands so what are the next steps and the consequences for the decision making the re, you know having the proper uh, uh, brain resources to take decisions to be driving to do finances and things like that so uh, it becomes an interaction uh, maybe not all the questions can be solved in one single first encounter, but keep track of uh, uh, the information that are, you are in need of. And if you become, if you come prepared to that encounter, then it, it will give you a much greater uh, uh, results and satisfaction with this uh, this interaction. I cannot emphasize the importance of being prepared because, you know, when I was given the appointment to go with my mom and take her to see a neurologist, I kind of feel like I was a deer caught in the, he in the headlights where I was there. I wasn't prepared. You know, you don't have more than, you know, 10 minutes or so with, with a doctor. And I was just sitting there kind of like frozen. And so I wish I would have been properly prepared so that I would have taken the time necessary to ask these important questions. So please make sure you provide prepared. Second thing that's important to know that I, again, I've, I, these were only things that I realized later on, but 
there's a shock factor. And so it, regardless of whether somebody's receiving a diagnosis of dementia, it could be any type of illness. You're, you're all of a sudden, you're receiving this news about a medical condition that you know is going to interrupt your life. And it's kind of like that, that news that takes your breath away, right? And that's when oftentimes these coping mechanisms that I talked about earlier start to enter into your life because you're feeling that stress. You're living by that phone. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Like every time the phone rings. And what I did learn was even after my mom had passed away, I had been trained for 12 years to respond in a certain way. And again, th that, that way of responding every time the phone rang, it didn't just go away because my caregiving days had ended. I was, I had to unlearn all of that. So yeah. just everybody be aware, right. That when you receive this news, it really has an impact on you. Yeah. Sometimes uh, Claire, I've noticed uh, that by giving a name to the condition, to the situation, making the diagnosis, it also helps the caregiver to uh, feel that, Ah, this is the the reason why my loved one has changed so much, you know. So mm -hmm. it comes as well as a, a reassurance that I was not totally off, you know. Uh, I did mm -hmm. observe some changes, uh, and uh, his unwillingness to do certain things it was not because he is of his bad character. It's because he can no longer do it, and this brings some peace into into this relationship. Mm -hmm. so, so this one how about you talk about this one <laughs> yes because it's an essential uh, aspect of the disease one has to accept what one cannot change and unfortunately if the diagnosis is right uh, there is consequences and already the caregiver is experiencing it so uh, we, we have to find a way of accepting this is the reality that I, I'm living with, but I am not alone. There is things that can be done, can make it easier, more and uh, 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 acceptable. And this is in what we should insist, not in negative aspects only, as well as the positives uh, that can appear despite the, the, the severity of the, the diagnosis, you know. What I say a lot to, you know, family members especially is that your goal, I know that you want to take the best care possible of your loved one. You you do. You love them. The problem is that if you stay in a place of denial, you cannot get to the next step of going and seeking the, the, the support that you need or the medical attention. So yes. if you pr pretend that this condition or these symptoms or the diagnosis is not real, you're not taking the steps to move forward and getting the help, you know, the proper care for your loved one. So you know, that whole many thanks, but I'm not there yet, or, you know, I don't want to discuss it, will eventually lead to the cyclone. You know, I call this the cyclone of caregiving. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it takes a crisis before family members ask for help. You don't yeah. want to get there. You just don't. I, I fully agree with you. Yeah. So knowledge, everything, the core of our program is about education, right? So education is key. Yeah, it is my impression that that knowing about the disease, uh, it, it, it's already having 50% of the answers to all aspects of the disease. It, it empowers you to really dedicate the attention, the care, and the good time that you can still spend with your loved one because you know what it is about. And and uh, any difficulty you will encounter, you can you you understand it's it's because your loved one doesn't have the resources anymore to communicate, to uh, collaborate, to interact, and then having that knowledge of the disease will help go go through this journey in a much more peaceful and positive uh, way. Mm -hmm. And I want to also group in the education about the resources that are available in the community. So you want to understand the disease from A to Z, but you also want to understand that when you need to receive some type of support, whether that be from the public health care system, community organizations, you know, for-profit organizations, whatever you need, that you go and you know how to access them. Okay, so education is, is, is really vast and all of that. So, the, so knowledge is really power when it comes to getting through this. 
all right, plan for the future. So what this, I'm sure these are conversations that you have with a lot of your patients. Uh, definitely, because indeed that disease has an impact first in all of the, the uh, reasoning of the person, the recall, the what to do. Uh, our lives have become more complicated than two, 300 years ago. Uh, there's so many ramifications and, and uh, we need to prepare ourselves. Uh, the disease goes into different stages and uh, reach a point where the person's own uh, mind resources are not able to accomplish these tasks anymore. Uh, at the beginning, tasks such as uh, solving finances and planning for groceries and you know, daily things that one does, uh, it's losing. And eventually, even the basic aspects of our self-care, it's also impacted. Uh, the capacity to take a bath, to choose our what to, to dress, our clothing. So uh, they need assistance. And if you know the disease and the different stages it goes through, it helps you tremendously to foresee what is coming. Uh, ask for appropriate support because we should never face this disease alone. There is so many facets of life that is impacted by the disease that one needs to have the proper resources to maintain the loved one uh, uh, what, what in their home and an own environment the, the longest possible, you know. So the importance of a mandate, how important is that? Oh, uh, as um, the person progresses in, in cognitive deficits and difficulties and there is decisions to be taken uh, uh, and they are no longer capable of, before they reach such, such a stage, it is highly recommended. It's a must, in fact, where uh, the, the person should make a will and a mandate. The mandate being that part of the will in which they specify that when I reach a stage of my life, I cannot take a decision. I, I like my wife, I like my kid or my two kids to then take the decisions for me because it might happen. It might happen also because of physical diseases. You know, uh, if you have a, a major stroke or you have a, a brain tumor, you might not be able to take decisions anymore. If you have that mandate, then it will simplify your life and that of your family. And I'd like to just let everybody know, I highly recommend that you keep a copy of the mandate with you at all times. I mean, I remember with my mom, when I had to move her from her home into a residence, even though I had sent a copy to the telephone company or the cable company or the government for tax purposes, I would always speak to somebody who would say to me, oh, well, I'm sorry, but we don't have a copy on file. Same thing yeah. with the banks. So make sure that you have a copy with you. I actually would keep a copy in my purse uh, at all times because I, you know, as frustrating as it was over and over again, people would say, I'm sorry, but we don't have a copy. So make sure you have extra copies of that mandate. It's a very good point indeed. So um, more than ever, I think during these unprecedented times, it's important to have not only a plan A, but a plan B regarding our wishes, right? So, you know, I hear a lot of families, I'm sure as you do, who say, oh no, I'm, my loved one is going to stay at home for as long as possible. I made a promise, they made me promise that they would never go to a residence, et cetera, et cetera. But we are currently living in unprecedented times. So if what happens if the primary caregiver, so the spouse or the child, something happens to them, what's next, right? So Dr. Mohair, maybe you could expand well, on that. Well, it's not uncommon because we love our our family member, you know, that we, we want to keep that person with us forever. But the reality can be very different, uh, not only because oneself, one can can have some, you know, health condition preventing it, but as well as the, the disease progresses to the point that uh, in the very late stages, and this can take another uh, from the beginning of the diagnosis to that stage, another five, six years, seven years, uh, you know, you reach a stage that you need almost a, a hospitalized environment, you know, and, and it becomes too difficult to maintain your loved one at home. So never make a promise uh, that you cannot really foresee the the, uh, the needs. So the attitude is to say, I will keep you with me, you know, as long as possible, but not forever with the certainty that it will be this way. So voila, it's my advice in the, this particular topic. All right, next point, I'll let you take this one. 
My, yes, uh, because we tend to forget that the, the, the brain is the central <laughs> of our decisions. And, and uh, eventually, uh, uh, as the brain is failing, it will impact other aspects of our physical function, not only the planning, as well as the execution of the movements. And, and then uh, you, you, you need to have a, a safe environment because the person might take a risk uh, due to uh, lack of reasoning uh, on taking some, some product that, that uh, can be poison as well as taking a risk because they don't assess uh, that physically can, can, they, they, they can have a fall from it. An example being decided to uh, clean the, 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 the kitchen, uh, uh, you know, uh, cupboards, et cetera, and mounting into a, a stool or, or, or a ladder. And, and frankly, accidents do happen. So the risk assessment is impaired. Also, because as one ages, uh, there is less flexibility, et cetera. Uh, and we have to be careful. And, and uh, assuring safety is the most important aspect uh, for, for the, the, the person suffering from dementia to be in a safe place, you know. Now the kitchen has all kinds of hazards. For instance, the stove, the microwave oven, you know, forgetting to turn off the stove, forgetting to turn off the oven, you know, putting in a, a cup into or something that doesn't belong in a microwave. And instead of punching 30 seconds, you're putting in three minutes. You know, I have uh, families that I work with where they're telling me how, you know, they mistake a cortisone cream or polysporin for toothpaste. So there's, there's so many um, hazards in the home that you really need to pay attention, as well as now the weather's getting nicer outside. Um, Dr. Moret, could you talk about driving? Oh, a, a very important aspect. I mean, driving is is not a right, it's a privilege. And uh, I, I tackled the issue uh, at the beginning, a person can still drive in the very early stages, but as it progresses, uh, the person might feel that they still are capable of, but they lack the proper insight to do the, uh, the, the evaluations. And then it becomes very risky uh, uh, to, to drive, mainly not because they, they, they uh, are learning something new, but simply because a new uh, event can happen, like a kid uh, crossing the street and they don't act fast enough or do being distracted and not respecting the stop sign, many things do happen. So it reaches a stage where it's something to consider stop doing. Uh, and this is not the family responsibility, it should be a healthcare professional to remove that weight on, on, on the, 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 the caregiver, right? But it's something to consider. Uh, and uh, again, it reaches a stage is not possible to drive. So just to clarify on that last point, so what you're telling individuals is that they should contact the family doctor or the neurologist or geriatrician and ask them to be the bad guy, right? Like ask them to be the one to cancel In, the license. Indeed. It becomes a medical decision not to put a, 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 an emotional strain on, on the caregiver, definitely. All right. So during this time of COVID, more than ever, you know, for those people that may have been receiving assistance from the public health care agencies and who are no longer, kind of like been a, a role change now. So we're seeing a lot of, you know, husbands, wives, sons, daughters that are taking care of the daily care of their loved one who has dementia. And that is a bit challenging because, you know, all of a sudden you are doing some very also some very intimate you know, um, care needs for somebody. What's important to know? I mean, this is where education is key. You know, as as the disease evolves, the person there, there's a lot of physical changes. It becomes much more difficult to to dress, to bathe, and at times to eat. And so, the approach has to be one with with care and with patience. You know, a lot of times we hear that you know the, the person refuses to take a shower or is refusing to get dressed, but it really comes down to what's the approach of the family member who's trying to assist them. Are you too rough with them? Are you trying to force them? Are you trying to push them? So it, you really, really need to go into this with a lot of patience. Yeah, the principle here, uh, Claire, would be that the caregiver has to understand that uh, their loved one is very limited in the capacity to adapt. And the adaptation has to come from us. 
not easy when we, we try to do things for the best of the person and the person is not following our recommendations, our suggestions. It's very, very nerve wracking. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the understanding here is that it cannot do more. If there is an adjustment to, to be made, I have to do it. And there is many alternatives not to insist on the spot, give a little bit more time, come later. At the same time, learn about what was uh, the habits of that person. If the person used to take a shower early in the morning and offer it by the end of the day can be very disturbing because there is routine mechanisms that is very much deep seated in our brain and change that routine can be disturbing. Same thing with comfort. You know, if it's it's not warm enough in, in the bathroom as we are undressing the person to help going for the bath can, can be very, uh, uh, a lot of uh, discomfort that makes the person push the idea of taking the shower. So these little aspects can make a big difference in making the environment more serene uh, and, and not too confrontational because the, the person with dementia cannot adapt. And in confrontation, it will answer or reply back with even more confrontation. <laughs> Well, that brings us to the next topic, exactly, which is understanding and managing challenging behavior. So like you just mentioned, I mean, the, the, the disease impacts the person's sense of logical thinking and just, just everything, everything that we would take for granted. You know, I remember my mom, I mean, even just being able to button the blouse or, you know, being able to prepare easy recipes, all of that she was no longer able to do. And I just yeah. kept saying like, well, I don't understand, but it's it's really about once you educate yourself on the disease, you'll be able to, to know why are they doing what they're doing, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, it takes a lot of knowledge about the, the, the condition, understanding from our part of their reduced capacity to cope and use our, pick our own brains to find alternatives, approaches, you know, uh, ways of convincing the person to to really accept the idea. Let's say taking medications, you know, uh, uh, providing some information that will make the person more uh, amendable to take the, the, the medication. Let's say a person has diabetes, you know, remind that, oh, you have diabetes, uh, dear, so you have to take this medication for your sugar, you know, uh, this type of things that automatically the person would do it before because they knew that they had diabetes, but they have forgotten that they have diabetes. So we have to provide that information just as just examples mm -hmm. uh, and, and to make uh, uh, the life uh, of the, the, the person with dementia, the caregiver, more easy, easy going instead of confrontational. I find that, you know, more than ever during this time of isolation, too, it's about picking your battles. So, you know, I often hear family members say, oh, my gosh, my husband or wife is driving me crazy because they're changing their clothes 10 times a day or all they want to do is go around the house and clean and clean and clean. Yes. However, for us, that may be unusual behavior. But for them, it's very comforting because it is keeping them busy. It is you know, it, it's providing them comfort. It is. And, and, you know, repetitive behavior is common with dementia. So if they keep cleaning or undoing the bed or, you know, going around the house, holding their purse and taking things out, if, if what they are doing is not hurting them or hurting others, let them be. You must intervene if what they are doing is dangerous to them or to your, or to you. But if what they're doing is not hurting them, just, just let them be. And, you know, I, I, I use the, 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 um, the term be a detective and not a judge because as they lose their communication skills and you start finding out that, oh, you know, why are they upset today or why are they angry? Well, it's about, you know, really looking at their environment. OK, first of all, the disease is progressing. So it's normal that the brain is changing. And so that, that may be a cause. You know, what are their surroundings? You know, maybe there's the TV on at the same time as the radio, and maybe they're being over, overstimulated. Maybe they are, they're uncomfortable. You know, they can, if they have, for instance, hemorrhoids or stomach issues, or they've, you know, un accidentally walked into a wall and cut themselves, and they can't tell you that they're hurting, right? So it's about being a detective and really trying to understand what's happening. 
It's just the very truth, and it's needed to have our own uh, resources, our own uh, mind put into play to find solutions. Because there is nothing that is uh, there's no recipe that will suit everything. So each caregiver has to use their own experience, know uh, the the family member affected, and propose ways of making life more endurable. You know. The term, the compassionate lie, you know, I've heard it used many times and I really believe in it's, it's important. And what that means is if you're going to tell them something that is going to really hurt them, why do it? So I'll give an example where a lot of us, I, I work with a lot of families and provide support, um, you know, and, you know, sometimes the caregivers try to find a place in the home where they can have some privacy. So they always say to me, well, should I tell my loved one that I'm talking to you? And it's like, this is time for you. And if you're going to tell them that you're speaking to a dementia care consultant, so because you're feeling completely stressed and overwhelmed, why would you say that? So, you know, when they're asking, I think everybody has to think when they're asking you certain questions, if what the information that you're going to tell them is going to be hurtful to them or cause them to become angry or full of anxiety, why do it? So what would you add to that, Dr. Mohan? Uh Certainly, the approach is the 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 that you're mentioning is the right thing to do. I was just from the medical perspective. I'm going to add one extra point. Occasionally, the disease, uh, as the dementia progresses, engenders its own thoughts. Uh, it's come of uh, thoughts of uh, psychotic thoughts about either seeing uh, someone strange in the house or beliefs uh, uh, that you know that uh, paranoid beliefs uh, that that they are stealing their money, they 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 are cheating. meeting cheating, you know. Then it reaches another level. For this mm-hmm. particular aspect, it's good to seek the medical advice, uh, see the doctor, because uh, occasionally they might need to have treatments. Okay, if it's taking a different proportion and the person is living on a very I- I- real world, you know, uh, there there is medication that can help. Not always, but can make things more easy. So do not feel that you have to confront all of these difficulties by yourself alone. You have to let the medical uh, uh, and and the, the the community support know about these. Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned earlier in the webcast, because of this forced isolation, it is making a lot of the symptoms evolve much quicker. So it's very important that if somebody is is, is becoming verbally or physically uh, um, assaulted, you must seek medical um, attention uh, for your own safety, especially as soon as possible. So please don't hide this. If you're if you're if you are being verbally or physically assaulted and you feel that it is escalating, it's important to seek uh, attention either from the healthcare professional or from the public healthcare system as soon as possible. So join join their journey. What that means is, you know, a lot of times with with repetitive behavior, people are telling the same stories over and over again, or they're embellishing their stories. And this causes a lot of arguments among couples. I mean, even among healthy couples, you know, it's like your husband or wife telling that same story you've heard 20 times. But it's just about joining their journey. Let them speak. You know, again, pick your battles. You know, if what they're saying isn't hurting anybody, just let them talk. Okay, and I think this comes to the last point here for under this section is, you know, caregivers, how is your approach? How is your energy? How is your mood? Because if you're not in a good mood, if you're frustrated, they can, your loved one can feel it. They're going to feed off of your energy. So maybe you need a timeout. So, you know, if, if it's time to give your loved one their meal or, or a bath or help them dress and you're in an anxious mood, you need to take a timeout before approaching them. So, Dr. Mohaya, how about t- talking about getting support as soon as possible? Well, I think is on on you cannot eliminate that possibility. You know, frankly, um, the the demands are so great in this disease that that uh, you need to have the the right ventilation, both in words, someone you can talk with, can uh, uh, mention what you are feeling, experiencing, as well as receive. Uh, the the assistance that you might need as well. When is bathing, there is services that can be offered as well as for dressing, but also uh, to to have the opportunity 
to receive uh, you know, information, uh, support from others. This could be a, a, a family member, uh, a cousin or a sister or, or a brother, uh, as well as professionals, because going through this disease alone, uh, you know, uh, it, it just unbearable, unbearable. We are not, uh, and I say this to my patients, we are not robots. We are humans with a heart and we can get exhausted. And, and then we start seeing things on the wrong way. <laughs> and we become, we want to control the situation so much that we become ourselves uh, negative sources of reactions from the, the patient suffering from dementia. So we have to avoid that. We need an equilibrium. We need to change our minds and we have to have resting time. And it's okay if uh, uh, two times a week you, you leave the house, but there is someone else to stay and protect your loved one. You need that to reach an equilibrium and provide good care to, re you know, remove frustrations, uh, uh, you know, pains that we might have hidden inside of us that prevents us from really expressing, expressing our love and our care. Yeah, essential, and, essential. And the, and the anchoring effect is essentially that the longer you wait to get some support for yourself, the more that the person that you're caring for is going to have a complete and utter dependence only on you and where they kind of like anchor on to you. So yeah. it's really important to try to have a little bit of respite for yourself because the longer you wait, the more difficult it will become to introduce some support. So very, this is something that you really are, are, are an advocate for, Dr. Moret, about keeping physically active and mentally stimulated. Yes, even in these days of, uh, of confinement, etc., there is there is still possibilities uh, to uh, to to walk outside with our loved one. Uh, you can uh, wear a mask, uh, and in fact, the mask is not even obligatory if you keep yourself from two meters distance with any other person uh, walking in, in in the sidewalk. You know, um, this way the activity is very much necessary. It procures a lot of resting to the brain. It might oxygenate the brain a bit more and enables one to moderate our emotions. Uh, uh, and also there's so many activities one can do for the longest time, you know, until the very end of the disease progression, uh, th that it's enjoyable, that that uh, and you know enriches the person who is losing capacity, and ourselves we feel good doing it. And this is a free booklet that you can download in English and French on, from our website that was designed by students from the McGill School of Physical and Occupational Therapy, which lists over 40 different types of activities that you can do. So I highly encourage people to go and download this great, this great booklet. All right. One of the most important last points is the importance of self-care. So caregivers out there listening, you have permission to have a life. At the end of my journey, well, not the end of my journey, but in the middle of my journey, um, I suffered a very severe burnout. And I really did require um, a lot of support, um, a lot of therapy. And I had to kind of, you know, make some, some big changes in my life. And one of the most important changes that I had to do was realize that I had to put myself first. And so the first thing that I had to do is I kind of had to do a triage of my own life. And I had to look at the people and commitments that I was currently involved with, seeing, committed to, et cetera. And what I needed to do was I had to filter out everything. So I had to make decisions and say, because I was only halfway through the journey, my mother was, was living another five years and it was becoming more difficult. So I had to look at the people in my life and say, who are the people that are that are, the, are having a positive impact in my life? What are the projects that I really do enjoy being a part of? And what are the ones that I don't? You know, so for example, it's, you know, when you receive that email or text or phone call from a person and they want to invite you for lunch or walk and you say, oh gosh, I don't really feel like seeing this person today. Well, that tells you right there and then that like, you know, you, you can you can say no, okay? Or that, you know, you volunteered for different things and every time you get that email saying, oh no, not again, it's time to let go because it takes so much energy. So, you know, you need to try to set boundaries. Now, with regards to family members, you know, all of us, you know, there may be people in your family that you that are difficult and you, you say, I just can't get away from this person. But 
you can put boundaries. So instead of having dinner with certain people, you can have lunch, okay, or just have a coffee. But you have to set boundaries, right? So let go of the things that are not serving you and really surround yourself as much as possible with with positive things. The other the other thing that's important to know is don't be afraid to say no. You know, stop feeling guilty because guilt is not going to serve any purpose and stop apologizing. Like just stop apologizing. I spend so much time feeling guilty, so much time, you know, uh, you know, afraid to say no or giving explanations and it wasn't serving me, you know? Now we have have we have had a lot of other McGill Cares webcasts that are focusing on, you know, um, coping skills for caregivers. And there's a great one with Dr. Tamara Sussman on really taking care of yourself. I encourage you to go back. We've produced over 41 websites uh, webcasts this past year where you can learn a lot about taking care of yourself. You know, I, ca I cannot emphasize enough once again the importance of education. Right, education. Once you know when you're when you're feeling educated, you feel empowered. So, you know, take the time, educate yourself, but know, like, you know, without you, nothing else is going to happen. Right? You have permission to have a life. Dr. Mohead, do you have any final words? Maybe just emphasize the fact that um, it is a dyad. The dyad means two persons, and let's say as the time passes by you have even bigger responsibility and role to play. And if you fail because of you are in burnout, you know, then it's even worse for your loved one. So you have to find an equilibrium, learn to uh, have others helping you uh, uh, to facilitate your life. And you have the right to take time for your own self because this brings an equilibrium that enables you to take better care of your loved one. And uh, it's so essential, it's so essential. Dr. Moret, thank you so much for joining me today on this very important webcast to support family and informal caregivers. It was a real pleasure uh, once again to discuss with you these aspects of care. Uh, and uh, we have to continue our, our mission of educating and empowered people to look after their loved ones. Well, thank you. So please join me on Wednesday, May 26th for the topic of living well with dementia. Both of my guests have been diagnosed with early onset dementia and have become well-known advocates for the rights of persons living with dementia, public awareness and destigmatization of dementia. So it'll be, a, it'll be a, looking forward to a great interview with two people who are living with the disease. This webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. Once again, I would like to thank Ryan and Dominic Lynam for supporting today's webcast in memory of their wonderful nanas, Stella Pearson and Marielle Wilson. If you would like to make a contribution to our program or for more information, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you would like to join our mailing list, please email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Thank you for watching.